Come on, how many know all we need is Jesus? I want you to realize that for a few moments here this morning. All you need is Jesus. You came to church because you knew that the doors were open. You came to church because you need Jesus. We don't come to church because we have it all together. We simply come because we need Jesus. If there was ever a time where we as God's people need to cry out, the time is now. Regardless of what you're going through here this morning, you may be on a mountaintop, but the need doesn't change. You still need Jesus. Or you may be in the middle of a valley. Jesus is the answer. Father, we love you here this morning, God. We ask that your anointing would be in this place. As I stand behind your office, God, we need you. We don't need a better strategy. We do not need another idea. We simply need you. We need you to move in every heart and flow in every home. Anoint your word this morning as we were careful to give you all the honor, to give you all the glory, to give you all the praise and all the worship. And Jesus' mighty and powerful name, the Church of God says, Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. You may go ahead and be seated here this morning. Praise the Lord. Well, I just want to you know, thank the Lord for my salvation and all that he's done within my life. And I'm in awe of God. I'm in awe of who he is for what he's done. If you only knew... The things that God can do when we just allow him to rule and reign in our hearts. Amen. So I thank him for everything that he's been in my life. I want to thank my pastors, Pastor Nick and Sister Myra Walker, for this awesome privilege to uh, get behind this pulpit. And last but not least, I just want to thank my wife. Uh, for putting up with me when most people would have threw in the towel. I thank you and I love you from the bottom of my heart. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's have church now. <laughs> uh, we didn't come in this place to cry. We didn't come in this place to let tears overwhelm us, but we came to have some church here this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have your Bibles right there. Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. If you're putting a title to this morning's message, I've entitled it, Drenched Altars Still Burn. Drenched Altars Still Burn. 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to be reading the story of Elijah on the mount, on Mount Carmel. And I believe more now than ever as God's children... We need to return back to the altar. We've been talking about revival. You've been hearing a lot about, you know, revival taking place. And we desire to see God move in the hearts of his men, his women, his children. And I believe with all my heart that it, we have to come back to the altar. we got to get back to the place where we come to the altar because the altar represents something. Amen. The altar was the place where God began to get a hold of people's lives. Where God would begin to mold and shape men and women for his purpose. And every time that you've seen a move of God or you've seen something take place within the Bible, it, men and women came to the altar. In the Old Testament, you've seen the emphasis and the importance of what it meant. And Elijah right here in this portion of scripture that I'm about to read, he finds himself, you know, in a battle. 
He finds himself crying out on behalf of the Lord for his children to arise and to wake up. Much like Sister Julie's war cry. Come on, that was an on-time strategy right there. That wasn't just another idea that Victory Outreach International came up with. That was a God move. That was a God move for, that, for yesterday's time where, you know, I don't know about the other states or the other cities, but I know here in Chicago, I know here in Illinois, people thought they were going to be celebrating one thing, but they were able to receive a whole nother thing. When they were lifting up man's name, the women of God were lifting up his name. So it was a strategic moment in, 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 in time for not only Victory Outreach International, but for our city. Amen. They were able to hear the message of Christ Jesus. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 16, this is how the word of the Lord reads. It says, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? Come on, how many know you, you thought he was talking about you already? You troubler. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have chosen to follow the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount, Mount Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of of Asherah, who eat in Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut into it into let it, them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood but not set fire to it. And I will prepare the other and put it on the wood and not set fire to it. And this is what I really want you to capture here. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. Come on, I'll read that one more time. I think that's worth repeating here this morning. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Drenched altars still catch fire. We need the altars of America. We need the altars of the men and women of God to be revived. Nowadays, the altar has been dismissed from many churches. You very rarely hear of an altar call. They get up behind the pulpit, they give 15, 20 minutes of something that feels good. They tell them, God bless you, have a wonderful week. But yet, there was never an altar call. And yet, we still tell people to have a good week, but we didn't open the altar for them to come and allow their lives to be consumed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we need the altars of America to be revived once again. And I, that's what I love about the ministry of Victory Outreach. We understand the importance of the altar. We understand what it is to come to the altar and, and to place our needs before God. To place our hearts before a living God and say, Lord, I need you to move in my life. I can't do this on my own. I can't make it without you. Are we still desperate to see God move? Are we still hungry to see the living God be on display? Do we still have an urgency, men and women of God, to say, Lord, we want you? You see, as we look at Elijah here on Mark Carmel, 
we read that he's in the middle of a contest with the false prophets. He's there in the middle of, a, 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 of, a, of confusion and chaos. All the prophets of Baal there are representing, and they're representing hard. And Elijah says, I'm the only one of the prophets left for the Lord. So in the natural eye, Elijah could have said, man, why even bother? Why even try? Why should I even try to do the will of God when it's 450 to 1? But oh, I believe that Elijah knew that all the power was on his side. I believe that he knew that his God was well aware of the situation. And he just simply spoke to Elijah and told him, all I need you to do is trust in who I am. Listen to me, Victory Outreach Chicagoland. I believe God is saying here this morning, I just need you to trust me. I'm about to crack open the city. I'm about to part the waves. I'm about to open the skies and pour my spirit out. Do we still believe? Do we still believe that he is God? It doesn't matter what man is in charge. Oh, I'll say that one more time. It doesn't matter what man you put in charge. What matters is that God is still king. He still reigns. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? You see, the altar was a place that it, it symbolized, a place of separation. It symbolized a place of consecration. It's where the men and women of God were able to come and consecrate themselves, devote themselves to God. See, in the Old Testament, it was, a, it was a place of sacrifice. Do we still have men and women that have a desire to sacrifice before the living God? Men and women that are willing to fall to their knees and say, God, I'm sacrificing my needs before you. I'm sacrificing my will before you because I believe that you're going to move, that you're going to rescue my family, that you're going to save my children. It was a place of consecration. It was a place of focus. It was a place of recal uh, recalibration where people were able to align themselves once again. And I believe this message is so important because we need a spiritual alignment. Come on, if you ever had any back problems, hello somebody. Uh, as you start getting about my age, things start hurting in places you didn't even know you had bones in. Amen. I wake up when I, I, I hurt when I yawn. Somebody said I was blinking and I pulled my muscle. <laughs> when you have back problems, you understand the importance of a chiropractor. You understand of being aligned once again. But I believe in even more in the spiritual. God's men and women need a spiritual alignment here today so that we can refocus, so that we can understand we serve a mighty God. Amen? See, Elijah was being a mouthpiece for the Lord. He was giving a warning. He was telling them, listen, you guys can do it how you want to do it, but I'm going to do it the way the Lord instructs me, and we're going to see who God is. You see, altars were places of prayer. They were places of assembly. It's where God's children were able to come together and cry out to him on the behalf of their family. It's the very thing that I believe Joshua understood when he made that bold proclamation that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But the main focus of the altar was the place of sacrifice. And oh, we don't like that word sometimes. Oh, why do I got to continue to sacrifice? Didn't I already give God my, my, my time? Didn't I already attend service on Friday? Oh, come on, somebody. Why do I got to go on Sunday as well? Or oh, now they're asking me to log in on Zoom? See, Zoom could be a good thing, but it also can be a bad thing. 
Because I wonder how many people are truly paying attention. Oh, you just put it on so they can see your profile while you're still asleep. Oh, come on, somebody. Can I hide right here? Oh, is that just me? See, you guys are messed up. You guys say, that's just you. That's just you. Right there, you're in your kitchen, you're doing everything else, and you have it on so that people can know you're on, but you're not even paying attention. I need them to see my profile at least. Come on, somebody. We're good, right? Steve, I'm going to need you to walk me out after service. <laughs> you see, that altar was, was considered safe from the enemy. Come on, how many know we need safety from the enemy in these days that we're living in? We got to get back to the altar. God, protect us, Lord. Protect us from the hand of the enemy, oh God, because his, his agenda seems to be ruling. His agenda seems to reign, God, but we need your safety. We need you to move like never before, oh God. You see, Elijah was called to rebuild a broken altar. And what that symbolized for the children of Israel was a coming back to God. Come on, how many know we still got to come back to God? We still got to have that desire to come to God over and over and over again. Oh, I love that song that says, falling in love with Jesus was the best thing that I've ever done. You see, the old evangelist, Charles Finney, he called the altar the anxious bench or the mourner's bench. The whaler's table, what it symbolized where people would drench it in tears on behalf of just simply wanting to see God move. Come on, we have an agenda of all the reasons why we come to God. God, I need you to do this. I need you to do that. I need you to move here. But whatever happened to just coming to the altar saying, God, all we want is you. All we need is you, Lord. I don't come with my agenda. I don't come with my own desire. I don't come with my will and my plan before you, God. But what I want to see you, Lord, is for you to have your way. That's what all, that's all it is that I want. Oh, I thank God for this opportunity that he's given me once again in my life. Because all I want is him. I understand. I understand how precious this thing is. Do we still desire holiness? Do we still desire to walk upright before God? Do we still have that, 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 that burden inside of our hearts that says, God, bring us closer to you? I believe many a times the children of God are too busy in competition with one another that they can't see the hand of God move when it's in the sanctuary moving. Oh, my shoe's better than hers. I hope they can't tell I got a waist trainer on. I'm talking about some of you brothers. <laughs> huh? We're too busy in competition with one another. We got to get back to having that holy desire. God, we, we need your glory to fill this place. God, we need you to move in here. We need you to be on display, God. All we want is you, Father. You see, the altar was a place of mending. It mended broken hearts. It mended broken relationships. What does the Bible say in the New Testament? If you have something against your brother, you have something against your sister, go to the altar and make it right before God. Some of us got to make things right. Got to say, man, if I've offended you, if I've done anything that would have offended you here, I come before the Lord and I ask for your forgiveness because I, wanna, I don't want anything to be a stumbling block. I want to see you move, oh Lord. 
You see, we got to get back to coming to having that holy desire before God. Because how many know we drift? Oh, we're good on Sunday. But come Monday. Some of you even argue on the way home. Come on, men's home. Father Abraham had many sons, and he ain't one of them. Huh? I'll be a stepson as long as I'm a child of God. Amen. You see, there's things that we can, we can see when we have drifted away from the altar of God. When we see that our delight is no longer the Lord's delight. It's an indication that we've fallen out of love or we've moved away from our first love. Come on, in the book of Revelations, chapter 2, he said, This one thing that you have done, you have forsaken your first love. Tell, he was telling them, listen, you're a good church. Oh, how many know the church can be good? But he says this one thing. You praise me with your lips. But your heart. God says, I don't want lip service. I want your heart today. I long for your heart because the Lord knows when he has your heart, he has you. For where your heart is, your treasure will also be. Amen. When our soul no longer desires to long for God. Amen. Amen. Oh, that war cry, I, I'm, I'm kind of in awe on that still. And I was just able to be a witness from afar. You know, I, I was just following them around because I wanted to capture it. I was right there like, you know, me and Dave were just driving around and we were, we were so close but yet so far. We were stuck on the other side for almost an hour. We couldn't get over because they were blocking streets, but we just wanted, we were right there, we were so close, we could hear them, we could see the sign. We were like, as long as we could see them, we know where they're at, and all we want to do is get closer to them. That's got to be our desire in the spiritual. God, I see you moving in her life. I see you moving in his life. And all I got to do is be like that woman with the issue of blood that she knew that if all she could do was touch the hem of his garment, that everything would change. We got to have that desire, church, to push things out of the way. To say, man, it doesn't matter if the crowds are in my way. Move out the way, brother. Move out the way, sister. I have a desperation in why I got to cry out. There's still something inside of me that needs to cry out for my family. I don't know about you, but I still have unsaved loved ones. Come on, that's reason to cry out. Some of you parents, you have children that are drifting away. Now you need to cry out, God, get a hold of them so I can send them to the UTC. Amen, so that I can get them connected and plugged in. How do we do this? Well, there's some things that we have to change. There's some habits that we got to get rid of. We got to change our actions, church. See, Elijah was telling them, listen, there's so many prophets that are serving Baal. And serving Baal meant that they were living in their own agenda. It was their own desire, their own way. They didn't want to follow the rules and the regulations of the Lord. Sound familiar? We're not a nation that any longer fears God. We no longer have that holy fear of who he is. Oh, you got your agenda? Yes, we're going to go for that too. Oh, that's your desire? Have no worries. We're going to pass that one too. You can live however you want. 
and still expect the blessings of God to flow. Well, it sounds like works, brother. No, it don't. It sounds like God is king. It sounds like because God touched my heart that it gives me a desire to want to do something for him. I'm not working for salvation. God already saved me. Amen. He already delivered me. But because he did, I now have a desire that says, not my will, God, but your will, Lord. Not my agenda, God, but your agenda, Father. Amen. We got to change, the, you know, some habits. We got to remember the devotion of our youth. Remember when we first fell in love with God. Come on, when you first fell in love with God, when he first touched your life, God, I'll do anything for you. Oh, one of the biggest curses that have, has plagued the church are these things right here. They're good when you're taking notes, but they're bad when you're on Facebook, you're on NFL scoreboard, you're on this.com, you're on that.com. When the Lord says, no, let's get back to falling in love with Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that, you know, these are great tools to have because we can keep, you know, notes and all that thing. But have we allowed it to replace our Bibles? No longer do people come to church with their Bible. It's quiet. When we first fell in love with God, when we first had that desire to wake up in the morning and put on prayer music and, 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 and set the trend for our day, do you still remember those days? Do you still have that desire, church, to say, I got to get in devotion with the holy God because I know that outside of these doors, the enemy is waiting for me. I know that the plan and the agenda of the enemy is right there waiting for me to step out of the doors of my home. And we don't know what we're going to encounter, so we need to drench ourselves in the power of God. Do we still have that desire you see, I love what the Lord says. He says, you're going to reap in lands that you have not even sown in. Why? Because you trust in me. Listen to me, Victory Outreach, Chicagoland. We're about to reap a harvest from the tears that our pastors have sown in. For the tears that our founders have sown in. For those intercessors that have gotten in these pulpits and these, and these altars crying out for your family. we got to have a change of heart. God, change me from the inside. You see, the, the altar that Elijah began to, to build, he dug a trench around it. He dug a, the, a, a trench around the altar. And what this represents to me here this morning is that Elijah drew a line in the sand. And he said, we're going to call what is good, good. And we're going to call what is evil, evil. Here this morning, do you still have that desire to draw a line in the sand saying, yeah, basta, enough is enough. No longer am I going to stand on the other side of the fence. But today, I'm going to dedicate myself to a holy God. What's your line in the sand here this morning? Do we still have a commitment to God? Come on, if we are going to see revival take place, we got to get back to the altar. Come on, that old school song, don't let me leave this altar the same, God. I want to be more like you. Come on, I don't want to be like Mike. As great as he was, he was still flawed. I want to be like God. See, Elijah had no choice but to confront the king. He understood, man, I'm the only one of the prophets of the Lord left. If I don't take this stand, the children of Israel are going to be lost forever. I must declare the goodness of God. Who are you standing on the line for? Have your way, God. 
You see, revival means that we're desperate for God. We're desperate to see the Lord work. Amen? Number one, the altar is a place of consecration so that therefore you and I must have that desire to sincerely follow God. There's a, there's a fresh fire being released over Victory Outreach International. And they call it the third wave. Come on, they call it the third wave. I'm here to let the third wave know. There's not an age limit, is there? <laughs> Amen. I want some of that third wave. So my wife, you know, like, man, I, I, I feel young, but my body's telling me something different. <laughs> Amen. I tell you, sometimes my eyelashes hurt. <laughs> Help me, Lord. We need that fresh fire to take place. Consume us, oh God. Drench us, oh Lord. You see that, that, that trench that Elijah built, that he, that he was digging right there. They filled it with seed and they filled it with water. And it began to spill over into the altar, drenching the altar. Thus the title, drenched altars still catch fire. And you'll learn it a little bit more in the rest of the story. But the altar was a place of consecration. And fire will fall on the altar of consecration. Consume me with your fire, oh God. Come on, we were singing that song, set a fire. Set a fire, Lord. I want to burn bright for your honor and for your glory. Number two, the altar is a place of confession and repentance. Come on, do we still desire to confess before God? God, my heart apart from you is wretched. You know my thoughts, oh God. You know my wicked ways, oh Lord. I come clean before you, God, because I need you to cleanse me. Somebody said, oh, you're one of them Christians, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, they brainwashed you. My brain needed a good washing. Huh? My brain needed a good washing from the muck and the mire of this world. Hey, I needed God to come in and begin to get those two brain cells that were fighting each other and saying, put them back together again. Come on, apart from God, we got some messed up thinking. Come on, I used to think that riding a bike with one pedal was cool. Huh? That's how twisted the world had me out a bike with one pedal. Brother, you should have just been on a skateboard. It was twisted. Bike with one pedal. My God. Don't laugh too hard. Oh, but look what the Lord has done today. Come on, some of you got to be grateful for what God has done in your life. Some of you got to be thankful that God called you by name, that God rescued you out of darkness, that God has called you to be his child. Come on, some of you... We, Oh, man, we can't be quiet anymore. It, for the life of me, I don't understand how we come into church sometimes and we're just barely getting in here and we have no energy. We have no motivation. We're sitting here and it's at 1230. Did the coffee already wear out? We got to come in here and set this place on fire so that when people come in, so that when people come in this place, the Holy Spirit snatches them and says, look what I'm going to do in your life. Amen. That's the desire that we have to have, that we can say, Holy Spirit, here's the lost soul, and let them have an encounter with the living God. It's a place of prayer. Come on, we can cry out to God on behalf of our family. That we could cry out to God on behalf of our loved ones. Get a hold of my children, God. Amen? Remind them of your love. I feel like the Spirit of the Lord is calling us to prayer. I feel like he wants his, his children to get back to just laying prostrate before him, just saying, God, we're not going to move till we see you move. 
the old time intercessor that went by the name of Father Nash spent days under the altar so that God's word would not fail, that God's word would prick the hearts of people while Charles Finney would preach, Father Nash would be under the altar in prayer, pleading for God to move. There was one time where he went three days before the revival and he checked into his hotel room. And somehow the door stood open a little bit. And there he was on his face before God. Day one passed. Day two passed. Day three, Charles Finney went to check in the room. And the, and the, and the uh, what do you call them, the clergy at, at there, the concierge told them, hey, you might want to go check on your friend. He's been on his face for three days. And he said, don't worry. He's just getting a hold of God. Come on, dude. We still got men and women that want to have the desire to get a hold of God in prayer. See, the altar was a place where we could receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do we still want to be baptized? Do we still want the Holy Spirit to move? Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Amen? It represents God. It's a place where we have that desire to see him move. It's a place of healing. Come on, how many need healing in this place? I was watching the, the, what do you call it, the commencement speech last night. And it says, time to heal our land. So said, our land is never going to be healed if we don't get back to Jesus. That's the first step. We can't just quote scripture. You can get a parrot to do that. Amen? We want to live by the word of God every moment that we have an opportunity to live for God. We need God to heal the sick. I still believe that God can heal the sick. I still believe that God can, give, can allow the lame to walk. I still believe that he can give the blind sight. Do we still believe, church? Do we still have that desire to see God move? And lastly, the altar is a place of worship. It's a place where we can lift our hands. I don't believe that. Why not? You understand what lifting your hands means? Come on, I want to come into the church house and feel like the police are right behind me every time. Put them up. I surrender, God. I surrender to you, oh Lord. God is calling his men and his women back to the altar church. Do we have that hunger, that passion? Lord, establish your altar once again. See, Elijah was battling. Elijah was pleading for God's children to rise up, to come back to him. To no longer walk around aimlessly, but to have that hunger and that passion and that desire to see the living God move. He goes on to tell them, and, and later on in the story, he goes on to share with them what was going to take place as he told them, listen, you go get, there's going to be two bulls, you get one and I get one. You cut it into pieces and I'll do the same. You put it on the wood and I'll do the same. When you call out to God, you call out to your God and I'll call out to mine. And whoever answers will be God. It goes on to read like this in verse 25. It says, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not let it light it on fire. So they took the bull that was given to them and they prepared it. They called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. They danced around the altar that they had made. Come on, how many know we can't do it on our own? Come on, they were, they were sitting there, they were, trying to, they were trying to do everything to look good. 
We're dancing. We're calling out to Baal. Don't fail us, Baal. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he's in deep thought or too busy traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and needs to be woken up. So they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of, of, of evening sacrifice. But there was no response, no answer, and no one paid attention. Oh, but listen to the story. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which had been torn down. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He dug the trench around it, large enough to hold two shields of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering of the wood. Do it again, he said. And, and they did it again. Come on, how many know when the Lord tells us to do something again, we still got to have that desire to do it again. But I already did it, Lord. I already prayed for a miracle. I already sacrificed. Do it. Again. Then he tells them, do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it a third time. This time the water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the private Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you are Lord and God and that you are turning their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Do you see the importance of what Elijah did first? First, he repaired the altar. Then he cried out to God. We got to get back to being children that cry at the altar of God. We got to be consumed by coming before the altar saying, God, we need your holy fire to fall in the sanctuary, to move in our hearts so that we can see you on display. got to come to God with that same intensity, that same desperation, church. Come on, this is an encouraging word to let you know that when we begin to come back to the altar, when we begin to flood our feet back to who God is, we will see him have his way. You want revival to take place. You want revival to consume us. Let's get back to lifting our hands at the altar. Let's get back to proclaiming he is God at the altar. Come on, how many of you have an altar in your home? A couple of weeks ago, we seen two people that couldn't wait to get to the altar. Huh? David and Maritza right there. Time couldn't go by any quicker, huh, Maritza? <laughs> There's a moment where I seen David nervous. If you know David, David's pretty stone-faced, right? And he just looked at me and I said, go ahead, let it out. And he started crying. I said, oh, I'll afford a seat, though. And I looked at him, and I thought he was crying for Maritza. He said, I'm hungry. <laughs> Woo. If you know David, he's hungry. <laughs> he said, when's the food? <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
that we have that desire to get back to the altar church. That we still have that hunger to see God set us ablaze for his honor and for his glory. Third wave, don't leave the altar. Don't leave the altar without knowing you've been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that here today we take heed to the warnings and we understand. Let's get back to our first love. God's got so many promises for Victory Outreach Chicagoland. God's got so many promises for each and every one of you. He's not done yet. We're getting ready to enter into 30 years. And I believe we want to see another 30 more. I believe we got so much more work to do to crack this city. There's more churches to be on the south side, on the east side, on the north side, on the west side of Chicago. We got to make the name of Jesus famous again. Why don't we all stand here? This morning. Let's get back to the altar, church. We want revival to move. And it starts with us getting a hold of God. I pray that we rise to the challenge, that we accept the mantle of the Lord to be a holy people, a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. Elijah stood on the front lines because he was desperate to see God move. I believe our pastors. Pastor Nick and Sister Myra Walker are drenching the tears of this altar with one desire to see God get a hold of your lives because they understand that if God gets a hold of you you're born bright for his honor and for his glory This morning, I'm going to open this altar. And I don't want you to, to come just because I'm telling you. I want you, to be, I want you to come because the Lord is calling you.